The city of Galway, Ireland, built as a naval base and military fort by Terra Edelbach Mac Rua Idri Ua Conair in 1124, refounded as a military outpost and town by Richard Mordeberg in 1230 he has been subjected to a number of battles, Saxon sieges. This article enumerates them. Dun Beel Gallum He Dun Beel Gallum He can be translated as, Fort at the mouth of the Gallum He River, it is believed to have been situated on the site of the present, Customs House. This building is situated in the heart of the old medieval city between Key Street to the north, Flood Street to the south, Druid Lane to the east and Key Lane to the west. Subsequent to the founding of Galway in 1232, a castle and hall were built upon the site. The latter building was known as the Red Earls Hall and was excavated in 1999. There is some slight evidence for Viking use of the area, at least as a seasonal camp, as the Danes of Limerick made a number of devastating raids in the area in the 9th and 10th centuries and though the analytic evidence is ambiguous, seem to have made some sort of semi-permanent camp along the river or in Loch Corrib. Be that as it may, the earliest known building was erected there in 1124 at the instigation of High King Terra Edelbach Mac Rua Idri Ua Conair, both as a naval base and military base Dunbeel Gallum, he offered several advantages. It was surrounded to the north by a number of small islands that, separated from the Dun by large streams and extremely boggy ground, made physical progress difficult and an attack futile. To the south it was bounded by muddy estuary flats and the effects of the tide which made approach from this side just as difficult. The Dun itself was raised at the very end of a thin peninsula of land that could withstand attack by a relatively small number of defenders. Due west was the river, which is one of the fastest flowing in Europe, and yet almost the only ford on the river. If all was lost, defenders could withdraw to the west bank and flee into IAR Connacht. If, however, the attacking force could still not make the east bank, there were only two other routes to the other side, neither favourable. One was to risk a crossing of Loch Corrib, which however can be treacherous at the best of times to an unskilled sailor. Second, the unenviable 60-mile slog north to Kong. From a naval point of view Gallum he did not make an especially desirable port, lacking a deep harbour. Up to the early 19th century smaller ships docked at the River Quay, while larger ones remained at anchor out in the bay for unloading. Yet in the early days of its existence it offered a way into Loch Corrib and its surrounding land mass from which an invader could strike deep into the heart of Delbna, Tier Dha Locker or Mycela. Conversely it also offered a route out of the latter kingdom and a means to attack its ruler's enemies. Indeed it was used in this capacity both in the 1160s and 1590s. At least some of these factors played a part in subsequent sieges of the settlement. Only much later in its history it would be put to use as the premier merchant port and market of Ireland's west coast. By then it had far outgrown its initial raison de tree as seen by O'Connor and de Berg and become the city of the tribes. O'Brien's siege of 1132. Naval-based warfare became something of a regular occurrence in early 12th century Ireland. The annals of Innis fallen note raids of this nature occurring in 1100, 1101, 1119, and 1124. Perhaps this was what led to Terra Edelbach Mac Rua Idri Ua Conair to build Dunby Iacute Al Gallum He in 1124. It was located in Clan Fergal, the territory of the O'Hallorans but was supervised by Ua Conair's vassals, the Ua Flathartai, who at this time were still based in their homeland of Mycela. During the summer of 1132, Conher O'Brien of Thomond invaded High Many where he plundered Manma and carried off many cows. This raid was purely of a plundering nature, yet apparently within a very short period of time. He followed it up with a full-scale assault on O'Connor's new naval base at Dunby Iacute Al Gallum He. The annals of the Four Masters noted that the castle of Bungalme was burned and demolished by a fleet of the men of Munster, the Munster men. 
then followed this up with a devastating raid on both Clan Fergal and Marciola. For the same annals note that, a great slaughter was made of the Connachtman by the men of Munster, wherein Conch Oba Ua Flathartai, Lord of West Connacht, was slain. Also among the dead were, the two sons of Cathal Ua Mufroan, and Ua Tide, and Teagli. This is significant because the Ua Mufroan were a sept native to Hymeni some distance from Gallum, he which was in any case historically based in a different territory, Clan Fergal. Therefore they must have travelled some distance to be present to fight against the forces from Munster, possibly in a levy raised by Teradlebark himself. U8 Hyde's nickname of Antigli indicates that he was of the household, or indeed the household bodyguard, of Teradlebark, who would of necessity have only accompanied the High King. Therefore the deaths of members of these three vassal clans, as well as his own possible presence at the battle, indicates the importance the High King attached to his, done, on the Gallum he. This is underlined by the fact that it was rebuilt, which can be inferred by a further attack in 1149, O'Brien's Siege of 1149. The 1149 siege of Dunbee Acute Al Gallum he was led by Twadhiel Vark O'Brien, then King of Thomond. It was a combined raid of plunder and military strategy. In the years immediately prior to 1149, the respective interests of Connacht, still ruled by High King Teradlebark Mac Rua Idri Ua Conair, and a Thomond had were confined to putting down rebellions in civil strife in the kingdoms, as well as maintaining their areas of interest. Rua Idri was frequently at odds with the O'Neills in Ulster and Meath, and had a sometime antagonistic relationship with Tyan and O'Ruek. King of Brefine, which was a buffer state carved out of disputed territory between Connacht and Ulster. Tward Hilvark O'Brien on the other hand was preoccupied with extending his influence into Leinster, as well as with putting down rebellion in his native Thomond and with ensuring his vassals of Munster, the McCarthys, knew their place. Both kings had in fact ratified a treaty at Terryglass Monastery in 1144, possibly to recognize and respect their spheres of influence. However the following year Twadhiel Vark was decisively defeated by O'Connor and his vassals at Fira Ceall in the Slyre Bloom. O'Brien had been en route to Meath to fight O'Ruek but had been intercepted by O'Connor. O'Brien was forced to return home, without prey, without hostage, without peace. Without truce, this brought O'Brien and O'Conhair into open war. O'Brien struck within the same year with an army into Connacht, and they carried off Ua Sirli, i.e. Tadhg, son of Conchoba, Lord of Ui Main, and slew Rua Ira Ua Flathartai. The death of Ua Flathartai indicates that an attempt may have been made on Gallum he. But O'Brien would have to wait a full four years before he reached this objective. According to the Four Masters, in 1149, an army was led by Twadhiel Vark Ua Brian and the men of Munster into Connacht. Until they arrived at Ma Ua Mabriluan, they carried off a great spoil of cattle, and demolished Dungalm he, and Ua Lochlen, Lord of Corkamo Druid, was drowned in the Galeem, again. The mention of My Ua Mabriluan, an alternative name for My Ciola, demonstrates the destruction of Gallum He and its fleet was merely one tactic, employed by O'Brien. Kinsmen and vassals would only stay loyal as long as a king could deliver the goods to ensure their loyalty. Hence the rich plains were plundered of their goods, food and fine cattle. It also had the additional prize of weakening O'Connor's prime vassal in the area, Ua Flathartai. Ua Lochlen was of the Corcumo Druid, vassals of O'Brien, and strategically located across Galway Bay. Thus it is possible that that while O'Brien led his army by land, Ua Lochlen sailed across the bay and the two inflicted a sea and land siege of Gallum He. This possibility is obliquely hinted at in the manner of Ua Lochlen's death. 
it may even be that, contending for the lordship of Galway Bay, from which plundering raids could be made into Clan Fergal, Mycela, Midriga and Uifia Krachadna, O'Brien may have been letting U.A. Lachlan unleash himself against a prime adversary. In a surprising turn of events, in 1151, O'Brien was deposed as King of Munster by his son, Muirhartaik. Muirhartaik was subsequently captured by treachery by Tadhd son of Diarmaid O'Brien and Diarmaid Sugarch O'Conher and delivered to his father. However, Tadhd Mac Diarmaid O'Brien rose against O'Brien in rebellion, with the result that Twardhilvark son of Ruira O'Conher came with him to defend the kingship of Munster for him. The Burr's siege of 1230 Cathal Crobe the Gua Conair had owed his position as King of Connacht to King John, and the support of the latter's vassals in Ireland. In addition, he was able to obtain recognition of his son, Aedh Mac Cathal Crobe the Gua Conair as his heir. In the year after Cathal's death in 1224, Aedh had to face a rebellion by Don Oge Magarity of Sil Muirdig. Aedh Ua Flath Batai of Mycela and an invasion by O'Neill of Tiruane from Ulster. O'Neill and Ede's rebellious vassals then crowned Turlo Mac Rua Idri O'Connor King of Connacht in opposition to Aedh, who was supported by only a few vassals such as McDermott of Moilurg and O'Flynn of the CUIRC remaining loyal. With the help of his Norman allies, Aedh was eventually able to suppress the rebellion, though there was not a church or territory in Connacht at that time that had not been plundered and desolated. The war was made worse by an oppressive malady raged in the province of Connacht at this time. It was a heavy burning sickness which left the large towns desolate. Without a single survivor, one incident during the war had given Aedh cause for concern. His erstwhile allies, the Normans of Leinster and Munster, had invaded South Connacht and slew all the people that they caught, and burned their dwellings and villages. Aedh was furious at this because it was not by his command, and because the Normans were themselves excited by envy and rapacity. As soon as they had heard what good things the Lord Justice and his English followers had obtained in Connacht at that time, it was a sign of things to come. Aedh Mac Hathel was murdered by the Normans in 1228 and Aedh Mac Rua Idri Ua Conair was chosen by the Normans and the chiefs of Connacht to take his place. Yet in 1230 Aedh and his vassals turned on the Normans, vowing they would never own a lord who should bring them to make submission to the Gauls. They made then great raids on the Gauls, Aed son of Ruri Dry and the men of West Connacht plundering the young son of William and Adam Duff, while Don O.C. and the sons of Magnus with the new levies of Silmurray plundered Mat Gozel Bentiamain as far as Athlone. It was in response to this that Richard Mordeberg led an army into Connacht and desolated a large portion of that country. De Berg brought with him Fella Mac Cathal, Crobe the Gua Conair whom he intended to make king in place of Aedh. They crossed the Shannon at Athlone and made straight for Gallamhe. The Dun at Gallum he was being held and defended by Aedh Ua Flath Batig, who still held for Aedh Mac Rua Idri. Apparently de Berg was just reaching the Duns when Aed Mac Rua Idri came to his help with the Connachtmen, including the sons of Muir Shertich O'Connor. At some point in the fighting Aedh seems to have lost or ceded possession of the Dun because the annals of Connacht states that they were on the western bank of the Galway River and the Gauls on the eastern. However, this does not seem to have been a decisive factor for de Berg, as much as a week passed with much fighting between them every day, and in this condition the Gauls remained, obtaining neither pledge nor hostage nor submissions from the Connachtmen, dissatisfied with the inconclusiveness of the conflict. 
De Berg cut his losses and left in the direction of Kong to pursue the cattle and folk which had fled into the mountains and recesses of the countryside and the sea islands, but as subsequent events would show, the strategic position of Dunbee Acute Al Gallum he had made an impression upon de Berg, and he would be back. De Berg's siege of 1232, O'Conher's siege of 1233, De Berg's siege of 1235, O'Connor and Magilla Padraig's siege of 1247, Plan Ricard's siege of 1504, O'Donnell's siege of 1596, Lord Forbes's siege of 1642, on the morning of 7 August 1642, to the considerable agitation and suspense of the town. A naval squadron of 17 ships appeared in Galway Bay, led by Alexander, 11th Lord Forbes. They had come to relieve the garrison of Fort Hill 1 at the request of the English Parliament, and which had authorised him, as Lieutenant General, to waste the coasts of Ireland. Launching longboats from the ship, Fort Hill was resupplied with food, arms and ammunition. Forbes then sent a messenger with a letter for Mayor Walter Lynch Fitzjames, ordering them to confess themselves to have been rebels, and humbly submitting to beg His Majesty's intercession for them to the Parliament of England, and to declare they would admit such governors as the King and State should appoint and until then put themselves under the protection of Lord Forbes. Mayor Lynch and the town council utterly refused the terms. To the surprise and anger of Lord Forbes, they instead made representations to the Earl of Clan Ricard, who was at the time a neutral, for protection. Clan Ricard in turn communicated to Forbes that, should he make war against the town, it would be both a breach of the peace and endanger the country by bringing yet another area into the war. According to James Hardiman, Forbes, stimulated by Willoughby and Ashley, captains of the besieged Fort Hill, and governed by the advice of Hugh Peters, whom he brought with him as his chaplain, was entirely deaf to every remonstrance of reason or discretion, being unable to directly assault the town itself. Forbes landed men west of the town and took possession of the Cladatu, on the west bank of the Corrib. All of the town's surrounding suburbs and villages were burned and destroyed. Dozens of locals were killed, assaulted and raped. Saint Mary's Church in the Clado was badly defaced. In its graveyard, coffins were dug up as Lord Forbes's troops searched the bodies for rings, gold chains and the like. Forbes placed two pieces of ordnance, or cannons, at St. Mary's and used them to bombard the city. However, they had little effect and by early September Forbes's men were becoming irritated at both their lack of progress and lack of payment. On 7 September he cut his losses and sailed for Limerick. Fort Hill was once more under siege and on its own, Clan Ricard's political stock had plummeted as he had been unable to prevent the sacking, and any waverers among the people of Galway were now solidly on the Irish Confederate side. Footnote Carrot 1 The fort at Fort Hill is shown on the upper right-hand corner of the 1651 map below. Square the Cladder is represented by the church on the lower right-hand corner of the map. Confederate Siege of Fort Hill 1642-43, Clan Ricard's Siege of 1647, Coote Siege 1651-1652. The parliamentary siege took place from August 1651 to May 1652 during the Cromwellian conquest of Ireland. Galway was the last city held by Irish Catholic forces in Ireland and its fall signalled the end to most organised resistance to the parliamentarian conquest of the country. Ginkle's Siege of 1691 